Well, welcome everybody to this uh, second uh, Robbins Lecture from Paul Krugman. Uh, most of you here probably heard his wonderful lecture yesterday, uh, and you might think that you were the main beneficiaries from the lecture, uh, but far from it. Quotes, this is from Bloomberg, after Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman said the economy will probably emerge from recession by September, US stocks rose 1%. <laughs> 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 uh, Amir, hundred billion dollars. <laughs> okay, the price of oil also rose, so did the price of carbon permits, all over, and always attributed to uh, this particular lecture. Uh, of course, not everybody gained. Uh, as Bloomberg also reported, the Australian and New Zealand dollars fell, uh, as Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman said, etc. So, <laughs> so hold your hand, hold your seats for tonight's insights. Uh, and Paul is going to talk uh, to us about causes of the crisis and other things. Paul. Okay. Um, so let me tell you the, uh, explain to you the, the, uh, the title. Actually, it comes years and years ago. I was at uh, uh, some place or other where they, I think it was uh, Bellagio. Uh, they, anyway, they had, they, you know, people were there, just uh, not me. I was at, at there for a couple of days, but they had people doing their, their intellectual retreats, and there was a physicist. And I asked, what are you working on? He said, the, the eschatology of black holes. Uh, I always liked that. Eschatology is the study of last things, uh, the, the final days, whatever. Um, so this is what I'm going to be talking about uh, for most of today's talk is how, how the hell does this thing end, basically. Um, but um, first I want to do what I didn't really do uh, yesterday, which is talk about how it began. What, what do we understand about the, the nature of this crisis uh, we found ourselves in? Um, and um, there's a first, the, the proximate story is not really a deep mystery, so I just pulled this out of the IMF's World Economic Outlook. Um, we had the mother of all global housing bubbles. Um, it was, uh, this is the IMF's measure, house price misalignment, not such a big, you know, don't, you don't have to take it as gospel. Um, the, um, but UK, uh, United States, Spain, uh, somewhat surprisingly, France all had these uh, really large bubbles in, in housing. Um, now, you might be surprised, by the way, just looking at the upper left, that the, the U.S. house bubble is, looks much smaller than that of the U.K. Uh, the reason uh, is that the United States, as far as housing is concerned, is really two countries. Uh, I called them flatland and the zone zone some years ago. They're, they're in the, on, on the coasts. Um, it's basically the way it is here. It's hard to construct new housing. There, there are limits. Land prices um, are the major component of, of home prices. Um, in the middle, we have these metro areas that just sprawl. And, uh, and so when there's an increase in housing demand uh, in, in Atlanta or in Houston, Atlanta or Houston just gets sprawlier. They don't actually, prices don't actually go up. So the, the, what we actually had in coastal Florida or Southern California, or to a more limited extent in the, in the mid-Atlantic states is, is uh, something that was, was a UK level uh, rise in home prices. Um, but anyway, big housing bubbles, everybody knew that. I will say, and this actually gets partly at what I'll be talking about tomorrow, um, the inability of the economics profession uh, and of, of policymakers to see this housing bubble uh, remains a, a, a remarkable and depressing fact. I, I, I have to say that I was focused on the U.S., but the U.S. housing bubble was the clearest thing, the clearest thing quantitatively I've ever seen in my professional life. It was just overwhelming that, that prices were way out of line with any normal notion of fundamentals. Um, and it was, uh, there, and there was no real excuse for it. I mean, we had a, uh, a technology bubble in the 90s, but you know, technology, at least there was something new. You could at least argue that we didn't really know how to value these, these new companies, the new economy, that there was something that, that was, was completely different, and who knew? Maybe pets.com would turn into the next Microsoft. Uh, but, um, but housing, you know, houses have been around, I guess, uh, 
uh, housing and a housing market's been around since the Sumerians. Why would you believe that suddenly the old rules no longer applied to housing? But nonetheless, people did. And so we had these monstrous housing bubbles, um, which in many countries, though not, um, uh, not in the UK, were not only associated with, with a big rise in home prices, but also with a, a surge in residential investment, uh, which was something waiting to, to collapse. Anyway, it was, it was not seen. Uh, still cherish the days when uh, uh, financial TV would denounce those of us who said, you know, there's something wrong here as, as bubble heads, uh, bubble burst, um, um, proximate cause of the crisis. Um, if you step back a little bit and ask why, what set these, these housing price bubbles in motion, uh, well, part of the answer was that we did have a low interest rate policy, uh, certainly in the United States, although that was because we had a, what, a, a fairly serious scare that we might be sliding into a Japan-style trap in the early years of this decade. We've put this in, in the, forgotten about that now, but, but we were scared about that. But more broadly, interest rates were low because there was, uh, to use one of Ben Bernanke's phrases, a, a global savings glut. Um, and it is just worth um, uh, just to give you an idea of, of how big it was and who the players were. Um, we, we tend to say, it's, it, to focus on China, th these are current account surpluses. Uh, we tend to focus on China, which is most of that developing Asia category. Um, some much smaller contribution from newly industrialized Asia, which is the original gang of four economies, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea. Uh, quite a lot from the Middle East. Um, uh, Japan, not that much growth, but still, but also uh, Germany, if you really b deserves to be put in this category. A whole bunch of economies that were um, running modest surpluses in 2000 began running huge surpluses. Some of them, particularly developing Asia, doing so as a, because as a policy matter, they decided that safety lay in the accumulation of vast foreign exchange reserves. Uh, all of this leading to, uh, you know, all of that surplus was savings that had to be, had to go somewhere. Uh, a lot of it went to the United States. Um, and as pe people were saying, it, it went to the United States because the United States had sophisticated capital markets and people who knew how to invest the money well. And, well, that turned out not to be true. But anyway, it, it certainly had capital markets that provided a lot of, um, uh, did a pretty good job of selling people in the idea that they knew, knew what to do with the money. So, uh, so the United States was the big destination, but also, uh, um, and one of the things that actually Ben Bernanke was very right to point out when he first talked about the global savings clot is it did go, in fact, to a number of European economies, the, the housing bubbles outside the United States. Um, one more point on the, the run-up to the crisis. Um, uh, when we look at these global imbalance stories, there's a tendency to say, well, it really was a, an America versus China story. Because if you work with consolidated uh, regions, there's an Asian surplus and a basically US deficit, and Europe stayed overall relatively balanced. Not a lot of net capital flow either into or out of Europe. But that's actually quite misleading, because Europe within itself replicated well, the, the imbalances that we saw at the global level. So um, these are current account balances of, uh, this is just the uh, uh, EU economies. Um, uh, huge, you know, um, roughly speaking, Germany, uh, the, in terms of the big numbers, Germany becoming a gigantic uh, capital exporter. Uh, Spain and the UK becoming large capital importers. Really, uh, Europe was a miniature of, of, the, of the world as a whole, with the division into surplus countries and deficit countries developing giant housing bubbles. Um, um, add on to that the Eastern European lending, which in quantitative terms is not quite as big, but was uh, it, relative to the size of the economies, gigantic, above all in the Baltics. Um, and if I find it baffling that people failed to see the housing bubble, I also find the, uh, the complacency with which people viewed those huge capital flows to Eastern Europe and to the Baltics in particular really amazing. Because it was, you know, by the numbers, it was complete reproduction of what had happened in Southeast Asia in the 90s, 
why people didn't look at Latvia and say, that's, that's Thailand, that's, there, there they go again. Uh, but they didn't, and so uh, we had this, basically this very broad bubble in the, in, uh, in, in the world. Um, and I'll argue in a bit that it's, it went beyond housing, um, but a lot of lending, a lot of borrowing, a lot of leveraging up. And bub one thing about bubbles is that they do eventually burst, and so it burst. And familiar story, right? We, we've uh, heard all of this quite a lot now. Um, the big surprise, at least to me, uh, was just how much damage it did. It was one thing to say we have a, a, a big housing bubble and when it bursts it's going to be very unpleasant. So I, I, I wrote back in 2005, I said the U.S. economy has become a place where we make a living by selling each other houses which we pay for with mar money we borrow from the Chinese and this is not going to end well. Um, but I had no idea it would end so badly and I think very few people did. Um, probably Nouriel Roubini, Dr. Doom, uh, uh, came closest. I mean, he didn't, he isn't just, you know, somebody who's been saying, oh, terrible things are going to happen. He actually had a framework, and, and, and it's, uh, it's been a framework that has worked really well. But, uh, but I'm not sure he, even he got uh, what happened. Um, uh, the, what we had, of course, was extraordinary, well, uh, extraordinary repercussions, uh, chain reaction uh, after the, uh, the bubble burst. Um, why didn't we see that coming? Um, I think... As I put it, as I think of it, it's, it's really, it's, it, there are several levels of fallacies of misplaced concreteness. Um, that is, there were things we knew about, uh, things that economists, certainly people who have been studying recent history knew about, um, that were, should have given us clues, but we thought that you had to more or less literally reproduce the conditions uh, of past crises to have the same thing in, in functional terms, and that was wrong. So uh, first, at the first level, um, even, uh, e even at the height of our belief in efficient markets and the stability of the market system and all of that, people did remember that there was such a thing as bank runs. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking tomorrow about the long uh, uh, slumber of, of economists about possible instability of economies, but bank runs people did remember. People did remember such a thing. There was some formal modeling of bank runs. People did think about them. Um, but we fell into, and I, I think I was guilty of this too, it fell into the mistake of thinking that a bank is uh, a big marble building with a, a row of tellers, that a bank has to look like a traditional bank, or to be a little bit more, a little bit less snarky, that a bank has to be a depository institution. And we looked out there and said, well, you know, depository institutions have uh, deposit insurance, they have well-established lender of last resort relationships with central banks, so yes, there were terrible bank runs that destabilized the world economy in the 1930s, um, but that can't happen again because now our banks are, are protected and insured and defended and all of that. Of course, a bank is not a big marble building with a row of tellers. A bank is any institution or any arrangement that allows people to have what seems to be ready access to their funds while at the same time financing long-term and or illiquid investments. A bank is anything that borrows short and lends long, anything that, that borrows liquid and lends illiquid. Um, and so a bank can be, to take the most extreme example of something that nobody thought of a, as a bank but was, uh, uh, we had this thing called auction rate securities, which was a fairly clever arrangement whereby people would lend their money actually at long term, but there would be a weekly auction with people getting in and getting out, which would reset the interest rate um, and with a penalty, uh, a penalty interest rate if the auction failed, and which would never do, of course, and so it, it seemed to be a, a great way for people to have quick, not instantaneous, but weekly or bi-weekly access to their funds, while at the same time financing long-term things. And so you had the Port Authority of New York and the Metropolitan Museum using auction rate securities to finance themselves. And what they were doing in the process was creating what amounted to a bank. Um, and it's $350 billion market uh, uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, it has now disappeared completely. The entire thing collapsed because people uh, some people, some auctions failed. People realized they couldn't actually necessarily get their money out of an auction rate security, 
And so everybody tried to get out, and so all of the auctions failed. And uh, in effect, that was a bank run. Uh, wiped out a whole fairly major segment of our banking uh, industry. Um, this, uh, this, this thing, that the banks that, that didn't look like traditional banks, but were for all practice, practical purposes banks, were a growing share of the, of, of the financial system. So I've taken, this is a very rough judgment, more or less I followed the lines, um, the, uh, the classic sort of description of what is a shadow bank actually comes from a fellow named Tim Geithner, who gave a speech about it um, in, in the summer of, of, uh, of 2008. And uh, using more or less Geithner's classification, this is my uh, percentage composition of US banking over the years from the flow of funds accounts. And um, we went from a world in which virtually all banking was depository institutions. The, the, red the blue line is basically depository institutions. The red line is all the other stuff that is arguably doing banking type functions. Um, and that stuff became vastly more important over time. Now you might ask you know, why, uh, and for most of this period, would have said, well, that's because these other arrangements are superior, they represent financial innovation, uh, all kinds of good things. Um, in retrospect, probably a lot of it represented um, uh, basically doing an end run around regulation. That, uh, that we, yes, we had, we had established and secured conventional banking. Uh, and so in a climate when people were starting to think that bad things never happen, they looked for ways to avoid the costs associated with that, to avoid the capital requirements, uh, to pursue more leverage, to uh, avoid having to pay money into the, uh, the deposit insurance system. Um, and so we went to this huge system. And of course, the point was that when the crisis hit, Far from having this secured, protected banking system, we actually had a banking system that was more than half as unregulated, as uninsured, um, as unpoliced uh, as banks were at the beginning of the Great Depression. Um, and you know, people say, well, we haven't had great waves of bank failures like we had in the Great Depression, but actually we have. It's just that they don't look like banks. But, uh, but if you actually look at, at what happened to all of these non-banking, the, the, the shadow banking uh, sector has suffered a huge shrinkage in volume, uh, comparable in its way to what happened with the, the wave of bank failures in 1930 and 1931. So we really have had um, uh, all that happen all over again because we were excessively literal. We thought that a bank had to look like uh, you know, a bank had to look like something Jimmy Stewart would run, and, uh, and it, it, it doesn't. Um, second thing that happened um, was a big increase in leverage um, through much of the economy. Not corporate, actually, it turns out, uh, but household. So this is a chart I keep on coming back to. Uh, for the United States, um, which is uh, household debt as a percentage of GDP. Very low at the end of World War II, which is something I'll come back to um, uh, in a moment. Uh, late, not in a moment, later, later in this talk. Um, but um, it rose you know, as people bought houses uh, after the war, stabilized for a long time. Then um, around 1982, started to uh, a big rise. Um, uh, come back to the reasons for that rise in a second. Uh, what actually happened here? Uh, wh why does it matter? Well, people are highly leveraged. They uh, uh, become vulnerable. If something happens to asset prices, uh, balance sheets get stressed. Now, this is you know, the, the strong version of this is what happens with financial intermediaries. So that's what's what's been happening to the financial sector. But it can also happen to individuals. You're um, uh, you have a large mortgage, your house loses value, suddenly you're much more impoverished than you would have been if you had, uh, uh, had not uh, taken on a leverage position. Uh, it makes you really, really vulnerable to, to big swings in the economy. Um, the way I now think about this crisis that we all went into, it is um, uh, much of the world got into a position of excessive leverage, leverage that made it highly vulnerable. Uh, we had a bubble so that when the bubble burst, all of a sudden you start to have large losses on certain, on major classes of assets. Every, not everybody, but large fractions of the world found itself um, with big balance sheet problems. 
And so you have this scramble by everybody in an attempt to reduce their leverage, an attempt to repair their balance sheets, which is, of course, there's paradox of thrift that I talked about yesterday. There is the paradox of deleveraging as well. If, a, a large, if many people are holding the same assets and they all try to sell those assets to pay down their debt, then what they do is they drive down the price of those assets and the balance sheets actually get worse instead of better. Um, this is, this actually has a name. Um, it is the, the Minsky moment. Uh, so uh, Hyman Minsky, uh, much neglected during his lifetime, but now much rediscovered, uh, argued that financial systems tend to evolve towards instability. That people, in a, in a period of good times, people take on more and more debt, they leverage up, uh, and then you have this moment when things start to fall apart and then you have a uh, self-reinforcing process where everybody tries to sell off and you have the deleveraging. Um, now, I should have seen this coming. I should have seen this coming. Because we actually, I had in fact, along with other people in the international, international macro, international finance slash macro, we'd actually been talking about Minsky moments quite a lot without knowing that we were. Uh, speaking pros all our lives, I guess. But anyway, you know, the, uh, um, the, in, the, in the midst of and the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis, we all kind of scrambled for a story to, to make sense of what had happened. And, and um, the, I and others basically came up with the model that said that this is about balance sheets. What you have in, a, in Indonesia, say, or in Argentina a few years later, is a country where people are highly leveraged, they've taken on a lot of debt, and the debt is in foreign currency. And so when something goes wrong and the currency falls, um, all of a sudden everybody's, in terms of domestic currency, everybody's debts explode and balance sheets are worse and that leads to a, a, a sort of a chain reaction of economic collapse. Um, well understood story, uh, we wasn't at first, I mean, no one saw it very well coming into the crisis, but um, by 1999, we sort of all understood that story, and, and then we had the very gratifying example of Argentina in 2002. Uh, you know, you have to have a certain amount of gallows uh, humor there, but Argentina, though it wasn't much fun to, for the Argentines, was actually a beautiful, the model worked exactly as predicted. Uh, so, um, we understood that quite well. But I, I think I, I myself and everybody else, well, fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Again, we said, well, so this is a story about developing countries with large foreign currency debt, um, which it is. And by the way, the, the Baltics are you know, going through exactly this right now. And that's one of the, well, I said, it's amazing that people didn't see that coming because we're re reproducing uh, Indonesia 1998 or, or Argentina 2002 in, in Estonia and Latvia right this moment. Uh, why people didn't see that coming, I, I still don't understand. But of course it's not just that one way you can have a balance sheet crisis is to have a lot of debt in foreign currency and then have, a, have your currency depreciate. Uh, but why can't it be lots of other directions? Why can't it be any situation where you have a lot of leverage and assets whose price can fall? And so we should have seen it coming. Uh, but, but we didn't. Um, how do I think about this figure? How do I think about the rise in household debt? Um, that's actually, you know, for the economists here, it's, it, modeling levels of debt within an economy is actually trickier than, than one might imagine. We, we do tend to, in our modeling, make the horrible but useful assumption of, of representative agents. Tend to think of the economy as being a bunch of people who all look alike. Uh, but that won't do when we're trying to think about debt because obviously somebody has to be the lender and somebody has to be the borrower. Um, so, let's see if I can get rid of that, thank you. Um, the, um, uh, you do it at the minimum have to think about different classes of people and to do this right, and there have been some, some modeling efforts, you really want to think about life cycle, people buying houses, it, it become, but it usually becomes a quite complex story. Um, in my thinking about it, and this will probably lose a lot of people, I, I reverted to my international trade theory roots. Um, in old trade theory, I mean really, you know, before I, I, I did something, I and others did something which came to be known as the new trade theory, now often referred to as the old new trade theory, because it's about, you know, it's 30 years old now, but, the, uh, but before that there was the old trade theory, 
the old, old trade theory, and um, the, um, where one of the tools we used uh, that, that's still very useful in some, to think about some things is offer curves. Uh, think about a class of people uh, who are lenders. Uh, think of, of them as, depending upon the interest rate they're being offered, they uh, are willing to make various propositions. They'll make, make you an offer of, well, we'll lend you so much in return for so much returned at a future date. The borrowers would be on the other side of this. Uh, um, if, uh, if you're willing to lend us so much, and, we'll, and you can think of these two curves, and, and it, it, it's just a, uh, this actually goes back, I think, to, to Alfred Marshall. But anyway, it's, uh, um, and it's an equilibrium in that kind of market uh, where the, the point where the two curves cross, um, and I guess that's the point where the borrowers make the lenders an offer they don't refuse and vice versa. Um, and, the, uh, uh, and the slope, the ratio of lending to the future repayment, sorry, the other way around, ratio of future repayment to the lending is one plus the interest rate. Um, that's, that's a very, that's missing all of the re realism of, obviously, of, of the actual market. The reason I find that helpful is I can then think about move it slightly in the direction of realism by, by recognizing that there are actually limits to borrowing. Um, you need some demonstration, or you used to, before the, those, the, the subprime explosion, you need to, used to, needed to have some demonstration that you could plausibly repay. Uh, often you need to put up some collateral. Um, and so you could think of it as actually uh, looking more like this. Uh, uh, lenders are won't, won't lend to people except that they satisfy certain conditions, so there's some constraint on the amount of, of borrowing that can take place, uh, which has the effect of reducing the interest rate from what it would be otherwise, if you just compare it there. Uh, but that's an equilibrium. Basically what it's doing is it's, it's reducing the amount of demand in the economy. Um, what happened, and then this can actually be documented, was that there was, from the early 1980s on, um, in the United States and in the UK, um, a big relaxation of those constraints. Requirements for collateral, uh, particularly, were, were reduced. Uh, it became possible to buy houses with, with less money down. It became possible to get consumer loans without any collateral at all. It became possible, in a lot of ways, to just borrow more. Um, and um, the most powerful explanation <coughs> of that is financial deregulation. Um, in the United States, you can put it quite specifically. Actually, if you look, I don't, didn't do it here, but if you, um, if you look at, at, the, at the time series, and this is not an original insight to me, it's actually something that, uh, that people who thought that the liberalization of capital markets was a great thing say, that um, there was a piece of legislation passed in, in 1982. Um, actually, it's actually double-barreled, because there was a piece, there was the Monetary um, Control Act of, of uh, of 1980, um, which did liberalized uh, had liberalized the interest rates that depository institutions could pay, among other things. But there was the Garn Saint Germain Depository Institution Act of uh, of 1982, which really pretty much dismantled all of the remaining New Deal era uh, restrictions on banking. Um, the most immediate consequence was it set the uh, savings and loans in the United States free to. Uh, to turn what was a serious problem into an unmitigated disaster. Uh, so we actually had a, a, a huge disaster of, of savings and loans, uh, um, gambling with, uh, with their federally insured deposits because the restrictions on their, their lending had been lifted, uh, probably engaging in quite a lot of sheer looting, basically funneling money to, uh, to um, bogus construction projects controlled by related interests. Uh, but in any case, um, even though the SNL explosion died a, a very messy and expensive death at the end of the 80s, uh, the liberalization of finance remained. And so we had this, uh, just going back, we had that. Starting, really, the, the, uh, um, the inflection point there is Garden St. Germain. And U.S. moves into much, much higher household debt uh, uh, accelerating over the years. Um, UK, I don't know as well, but uh, obviously a lot of financial deregulation here too. So in, in some ways, um, if we ask the question, why do we see this sort of shared destiny, uh, it might be 
uh, the you know two nations divided by a common language, but I suspect actually it's much more just we had Reagan, you had Thatcher. Uh, basically, that that that's the story. Um, once you get once you understand this, first of all, you can say that that uh, the liberalization increases demand, increases borrowing. Um, it also gives you some sense of, of why you can have a crisis. If you start to have problems, uh, people are, you know, balance sheets are, are going haywire, people are losing money, people are defaulting, uh, those constraints tend to be reimposed or tightened. And so the uh, expansionary impact of the deregulation, of the loosening of constraints, goes into reverse. Uh, and you can see that very dramatically in the United States right now as the, uh, uh, as private, I gave you, Yesterday, private sector borrowing collapses. Uh, household uh, savings, after having gone to near zero, shoots up. Uh, the balance sheet crisis again, not but not just as a crisis for financial intermediaries, but a balance sheet crisis for lots of players, households very much included. That's how we got into the crisis. Now I'm going to come back to a bit of this story, trying to think about how we get out. Um, uh, or don't get out, I guess. Um, I'm running slower than I meant to, so uh, bear with me. Um, before I get to the big issue, let me say that even before the current crisis, there was growing evidence that, um, that something was changing about the business cycle. We had not, outside Japan, had the lost decade kind of recession that never really ended. Uh, but we were starting to have uh, growing signs that, that recessions didn't end the way they used to. And uh, by the way, that may, maybe Bloomberg will put another story out which will cause the market to go down because while I said that a recession may well end uh, this summer, may well be declared to have ended, the thing is that the ending of a recession doesn't mean what it did in the old days. Uh, that in a way you could say that, that at least in the United States it's become clear that um, in a lot of ways recessions don't end when they end. Um, give you the strong comparison. This is payroll employment um, in the United States starting from the beginning of the 1981 recession which was up until now the worst we'd had since, since the Great Depression. Um, and from the beginning of the 2001 recession. And it was a terrible, wrenching recession, 1981-2. Uh, but when it ended, employment zoomed back up. Um, the recession in 2001 was officially declared to have ended after eight months um, because some things started going back up. In industrial production in particular started to rise. GDP started to grow. But as you can see, employment continued to, uh, to fall, and uh, um, it's, well, it took uh, about four years before employment returned to its level at the beginning of the recession. So although it was a short, shallow recession, by some accounts, it certainly felt like a very long-term siege from the point of view of, of workers. Um, you can sort of see this divide uh, the last 45 years into two epochs. Um, just using this as a fairly, unemployment rate would tell a t similar story. Um, the uh, shaded bars, St. Louis Fed does these nice pre, you know, you can, you can uh, talk their, their site into producing the diagrams you want. Um, um, the shaded areas are recessions. And you can see that in that period, the, uh, the recessions, after the recessions ended with a small lag the employment situation began to improve, uh, usually quite sharply. So really, things, things did turn around. Uh, uh, so we had this terrible recession in 1981-82, but um, oh, very soon after, uh, after November 82, the official end, things got, you know, it, it was, didn't take very long for Ronald Reagan to be able to say it's morning in America. Um, this, uh, more recent experience, uh, the 1990-91 recession officially ended in 91, but employment situation just kept kind of getting worse for quite a while afterwards, uh, long enough so that uh, 
Bill Clinton could run on it's the economy stupid and uh, and get elected. Um, and the 2001 recession, which is in some ways the precursor to what we're seeing now, um, really took you know it. it if you were looking only at the employment numbers, you would not have said the recession ended when it ended. And uh, um, clearly something's been going on that makes recessions longer. Uh, that makes the, not recessions longer, but makes the, the period of, of weak labor markets, of a depressed economy, extend much longer. Um, one thing that's been happening is that the interest rates at which uh, we go into recessions keep on falling. Um, 1981, and of course, since I talked so much about the zero bound, about the problem of the liquidity trap, there was no danger of finding yourself in the liquidity trap in 1981 when you came into the recession with a 15% interest rate. There was plenty of room to cut. Um, less so in 1990, less in 2001, even less in, in 2007. Um, those may look like extraordinary extraordinarily low interest rates for the last two, especially 2007. Uh, but that's because actually, well, this is the, uh, this is the change in short-term interest rates over the year preceding the beginning of the recession as, as officially dated. Um, what's going on there? What's basically going on is that before 1985 or so, um, the reason we had recessions was that inflation was starting to heat up. And the central bank, the Federal Reserve, would raise interest rates and attempt to choke off inflation. And then we'd get into a recession, which would disinflate the economy. And when the Fed decided that we had suffered enough, it, it would relent and we would have a recovery. Um, increasingly, since the mid-'80s, what we've had is long booms that never lead to much inflation, uh, that um, basically collapse of their own weight. Uh, you have some kind of bubble that bursts. And actually, the Fed increasingly has started cutting interest rates, trying to head off the, the deleterious effects of the bursting bubble uh, before there's actually an official recession, um, but not enough to, in fact, stop there from being a recession. And because there isn't that much room to cut rates once the recession hits, at least that's part of the explanation of why the recessions go on so long. Underlying all of this uh, is the, what we used to call a great success story, uh, which is the end of serious inflation, return to price stability, um, which was a great thing and everyone was celebrating the, uh, we now have a non-inflationary economy, but it turns out that a non-inflationary economy is one in which booms get to really get out of hand um, and in which um, interest rates are fairly low in general, leaving you less room to cut. And so we have a problem dealing, dealing with recessions. Since monetary policy runs out of room, and really has run out of room this time, again, we, we're depending on who you, who you ask, the, the, the Fed funds rate should be either minus 5 or minus 8 uh, percent, and you can't do that. So how do we get recovery? And that now is the, is the big uh, topic. What, what is the, uh, the how, 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 how do we expect to see recovery? Uh, um, leave aside for a moment the unconventional monetary policy. Leave aside the fiscal policy, which I'll be coming back to. What would be the forces that would produce recovery in, in, in our economy or in the world economy? Well, there's a textbook story. It's in every, every macro textbook, including uh, Krugman Wells, um, which describes, it's usually under the headline, the self-correcting economy, something about why automatically economies um, tend to return to full employment, even without active government policy. The government policy is there to, to accelerate this process, but economies are self-correcting. Um, and it looks, for all of you, uh, for some, of, some people, this has been an unpleasant memory of, of your first economics, first macro course. Uh, for some of you, it'll be an unpleasant memory of having to teach that damn, um, anyway. Um, right, we think of there being an aggregate demand curve, uh, downward sloping relationship between the price level and, uh, and, and the amount of stuff, the amount of GDP demanded. Um, in the short run, an upward sloping, or if you prefer, flat. But let's say upward sloping, short run aggregate supply curve. 
Um, but we argue that in the long run, the aggregate supply curve is vertical. In the short run, it's, it's upward sloping because wages are sticky in the short run and maybe some other prices are sticky. Um, but over time, if the economy is, on, has, is operating below potential output, um, wages will fall, sticky prices will fall, um, shifting that curve down until we're restored to a normal level, uh, basically full employment or normally full employment. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and, and at least in, in, in our book, we, we explain that, that in, this, in the long run, the economy automatically corrects itself. Then we quote Keynes about the long run. Uh, in the long run, we're all dead, which is why you have active policy just to, as, as a way to, to shorten this process, but not as a, uh, certainly, the economy does have an automatic tendency to return to full employment. Um, but we're in a liquidity trap. We're up against the zero bound. And I would argue that it actually looks like this. Um, why do we draw, conventionally, a downward sloping aggregate demand curve? The normal story is that uh, if the price level falls, um, that increases the real money supply, which will mean that people have more liquidity than they need, so they'll try to buy uh, They'll buy bonds, which will drive down interest rates, which will expand the economy. Um, that doesn't work if you're at a zero interest rate. Uh, expand the real money supply. Well, people are already holding cash sitting idle. They won't, it won't change if, they, if, you, if you make that cash more valuable. Uh, to this, the standard answer actually goes back to Pigou is, well, but there is another channel, which is that people have cash, the cash becomes worth more, because so people's wealth goes up. There's the, the real balance effect. Uh, and this is pretty wonkish for the economics people, but um, this is right, but you need to think about magnitudes. So in the United States, uh, before the Fed started its quantitative easing, we had about $800 billion of monetary base. Um, this is in a $14 trillion economy. Um, suppose that prices fall 10%. Well, that would raise the real value of that monetary base by around $80 billion. Uh, reasonable estimates of the effect of wealth on consumer spending are something like 0.05. So if we had an $80 billion increase in wealth, that would expand consumer demand by $4 billion in a $14 trillion economy, 0.03%. Uh, uh, it's trivial, the effect of uh, of uh, the real balance effect on aggregate demand has got to be virtually nil. Um, the, the effect, the, if there is a downward slope, the AD curve has got to come from the effect on interest rates, but if you're at a zero lower bound, there is no effect on interest rates. Meanwhile, there's debt deflation. Meanwhile, if prices fall, the real value of debt increases and the debtors are likely to be people with balance sheet problems. People will be forced to cut spending uh, if the uh, real value of their debt goes up, whereas the people, the creditors, are less likely to have balance sheet problems, less likely to be there, this is Irving Fisher, um, then surely those effects, those distributional effects, uh, will swamp the real balance effect. Sorry, Ma major wonkish economic detour. But the, the bottom line is that almost surely, when you're in a zero, bound, zero lower bound liquidity trap situation, uh, the aggregate demand curve does not slope down. It probably slopes up, um, which means, actually, uh, means that this automatic adjustment process that is so central to the way we teach economics just doesn't actually work. Um, it also, by the way, has, if you're doing history, it has some implications. Uh, um, there is, you probably know in the United States, a furious debate. History has become a weapon in the, in the wars over economic policy, a furious debate about the effect of the New Deal and uh, a, a massively ill-informed book called uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the Forgotten Man uh, is arguing that, that Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal made things worse. And if you try to get at wh where is they're supposed to have made things worse, it's because they didn't, they basically pushed up wages. All of these unionization and other things pushed up wages and, you know, so pushed up, the book doesn't put it this way, but pushed up that aggregate supply curve, which obviously was contractionary except since we were in fact in a liquidity trap in the 30s, this makes no sense at all. 
Uh, wouldn't go so far as to say that you know, it was a great thing for the economy to push up wages, although to the extent that the aggregate demand curve actually does slope the wrong way, it's not, it might be somewhat positive. But, but in any case, the, the, uh, but the main thing is that that adjustment mechanism doesn't work. And certainly looking forward, we cannot, in this world we're now living in, we cannot count on um, automatic mechanisms to lead us to recovery. We can't count on this automatic mechanism anyway. Um, if anything, uh, the, the great concern would be that, actually, back up for a second, when we were having recessions because we had stagflation, because you had inflation, um, then the, there was a sense in which the economy was self-correcting which is that having a lot of unemployment led to a falling inflation rate, which eventually meant that central banks could, uh, as I said, could, could decide that we had suffered enough and let the economy recover. Right now, weak economy tends to mean that inflation slips and heads towards deflation, which makes things worse because uh, if people start to expect prices to fall or even if they expect them to rise less rapidly, that makes them less willing to borrow. It reduces aggregate demand. All, all bad stuff. Uh, all familiar now, uh, all familiar to those who paid a lot of attention to Japan in the 90s, but now, now a problem for all of us. So, well, how do we recover? So we can look for role models. We can look to history for examples of countries that found themselves in the liquidity trap. Or actually, even let's not do that. Let's look at, at countries that had financial crises. How did they recover? Um, and there's a pretty consistent picture. Uh, the IMF, um, uh, the, this year's World Economic Outlook, so I had a picture from it, but it's full of great uh, analytical stuff. And I was thinking, gee, you know, I'm, I've got to think better of, of international organizations until I realized that the research director is, of course, uh, Olivier Blanchard, my old MIT colleague. But anyway, it's a terrific report. Um, and they do. They have this systematic comparison of recessions uh, across many countries and many time periods looking at, um, at where recoveries come from, um, and, among other things. And the distinctive thing about um, <laughs> recessions that are the result of um, financial crises is that, that the recoveries tend to be export-led, that the big thing that drives the recovery is a, a large movement in tor towards trade surplus. So you'll find that, for example, in Sweden in the early 90s, that the Swedish financial crisis was followed by a huge export boom. You'll find that for the East Asian crisis countries in the late 90s, that their recoveries were led by big export booms. Um, and you'll find that these are not uh, clear liquidity trap countries, but in the case of Japan, if we actually look at how Japan recovered, um, this, uh, the blue line is investment as a share of GDP on the left, and the red line is the current account balance. Um, and while there was some modest bounce back, I should say, but Japan did have a fairly convincing looking recovery from 2003 to 2007. Well, you can see the big thing that was driving it was the uh, move into a large current account surplus. Uh, these, with the counterparts of that being the United States uh, primarily, although many of the exports were sort of indirect by way of China, exports of intermediate goods to, to China. That's not a helpful role model, because now the whole world is in this crisis. And unless we can find another planet to export to, uh, it's, not a, it's really not a helpful role model. Um, Let me pass by the Great Depression for a moment, because uh, the Great Depression, well, the Great Depression, as you know, ended with a large public works program uh, known as World War II, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, um, I actually have tried a little bit of, you know, going back before that, what ended recession, what, what ended slumps, and um, uh, the trouble is, of course, we don't have very good data, not very good accounts, so you can try reading something like this, and uh, um, and it is not, it's really hard to pin down, though if I, if I believe what he's saying there, it's actually kind of disappointing. Apparently the really big thing that brought the U.S. economy out of the panic of 1873 was a, an export boom. Uh, so that's, again, not helpful. Um, okay. Um, what, do, what, do we, what do we know about uh, sources of recovery if, if you don't? 
do it through export boom, and you have no way of doing it through monetary policy. Um, there are, there used to be uh, a, a literature. People did think about this. In fact, there was a whole um, business cycle, nonlinear business cycle theory, all of this stuff uh, that was once very popular. Uh, much of it derives from sort of offhand remarks. There's one short chapter in Keynes about the, about the trade cycle, uh, which in turn was, I think, in many ways derivative from what other people were saying, but of course he had a framework to stick it into. Um, and he had a, a nice phrase. He said that investment eventually recovers um, as the capital stock is depleted by use, decay, and obsolescence. Um, that uh, you know, stuff wears out uh, or just uh, uh, become just fades away out of uh, from sheer age, or uh, there's there's replacement. Uh, you want to replace stuff because the new stuff is so much better, even if you have more capacity than you need, and so you get a recovery and investment from that source. Um, there's an alternative theory, which is which uh, I'm, I I hope that Richard Koo of Nomura will be happy to see himself lumped in with Keynes, uh, uh, which argues that what actually happens, uh, what happened in Japan, was the gradual restoration, re, re, you, people rebuilt their balance sheets. Um, let me talk for a moment about both of these. Um, so the Keynesian, well, how do, we, how do we make concrete this idea that over time uh, you eventually have to start replacing your capital? Uh, it's helpful to have some, well, uh, the, the, the example I like to use which illustrates what we have in mind is, is, is cars which we don't normally think of as a capital good, but of course they are. Uh, uh, it's consumer durable, but it's basically a capital good. Um, as of right now, the US has a, there are about 135 million registered uh, automobiles, about 270 million registered vehicles, but I'm just focused on the autos. Um, the rate at which they're selling, um, I'm not gonna try, some people can do a better job than me of, of, of uh, the seasonal adjustment here, but in, in May, we only sold 484,000. Let's say we're, that cars are selling at a rate of, annualized rate of around six million. Um, that means that with sales at the current rate, it would take 20 years to replace the stock of, of automobiles. And while I actually did not too long ago to dispose of my 20-year-old uh, Volvo, um, the, uh, that is not normal. It, it was in pretty bad, you know. Uh, um, and the, the point is that um, we would expect that a lot of people would feel that they had to replace their cars or simply that the new cars are, were so much better that it was worth replacing even if the desired stock of automobiles didn't go up. Uh, it was amazing actually when we bought that new car and discovered that hey, they have cars that actually have CD players in them. I didn't know that. Um, the, um, uh, and, and windows that go up and down with electric power instead of current. Anyway, um, so, so you have, um, take this much more broadly, and of course if you think about things like IT, the, there would be reasons to start replacing the investment, but that could be a really prolonged process before enough investment starts coming along for that reason, to generate a recovery. It's not endless, but you would expect it to take a really long time. Um, now, the um, Richard Koo at Nomura made a sort of obvious point, but it's uh, that that a lot of what was depressing the Japanese economy during the 90s was probably uh, the very high levels of private debt, and that what happened over time was a reduction in those levels of private debt. Um, and many people, this is from the San Francisco Fed, have pointed out that there is kind of a parallel. In their case, it was corporations. In our case, households. Um, is debt to disposable income rather than GDP, although it's not a big difference. Um, and if that's parallel, that would suggest that over time, US households will deleverage themselves, eventually become ready to spend heavily again. But might take a long time. The Japanese, again, had this lost decade. Um, uh, this is picking up from Richard Koo himself. Uh, just to give you an idea of how much, how much did happen um, in Japan, the, uh, uh, just use the blue line, uh, which is the right scale. Um, uh, corporate debt was 85% you know, of GDP, basically at the start of their crisis. And uh, over an extended period, they brought it way down. And arguably, that's 
made room for their recovery, although I have to say I'm a little bit skeptical even about this because the, uh, uh, when the recovery came, it was driven a lot by exports rather than by investment. But in any case, the, the argument being that over time, uh, you, you work down the, the debt. Uh, now, how do you do that? What happens during this period when people are working down the debt? Well, the, the coup argument is that actually the Japanese lost decade was not such a bad thing. The government engaged in deficit spending, keeping the economy afloat, not actually generating a full recovery, but keeping the economy afloat and giving the private sector time to rebuild its balance sheets. Of course, in the process, running up a lot of debt on the public side, but he, he argues that that was worth doing. Um, Still, it's kind of hard to take Japan in the 90s as turn it around from being the uh, horror story. And I, I, I've said, uh, you know, that the uh, uh, the story of Japan's lost decade is is the story that economists tell their children uh, to scare them into behaving themselves. Uh, to turn that around from to Japan becoming a role model. Um, what about the great example in the past of liquidity trap, uh, of uh, which is of course the 1930s. Um, so how did we emerge from, from the 1930s? Uh, well, we, you know, it's funny. Everybody says, well, World War II, which is right. Obviously, we had the, the gigantic um, uh, expansion of demand, uh, huge, huge fiscal stimulus. Uh, uh, it's been really amazing. You know, some people said, well, you know, this World War II casts doubt on the multiplier because private consumption actually didn't grow. And, and business investment actually fell, and yes, because there was rationing, you know, you couldn't, uh, but anyway, there was, uh, but World War II, this massive fiscal stimulus produced full employment. The question, though, is why, which, which really we should be asking is, um, why did it stick? We had this enormous fiscal expansion, that, sure, that's going to create full employment, but why didn't we just slide back into the Depression when the, when the military spending went down? Uh, which some people thought would happen. You know, there were some businesses that were hoarding cash, expecting the depression to come back. There were certainly quite a few economists who bought into the notion of secular stagnation and believed that the depression would just come back. Uh, why didn't it? Um, well, uh, I'm not dead sure of this, but I, I think actually the balance sheet story uh, um, is is our best bet. Um, this is. It's not quite the same series as household debt, but it's uh, you know, essentially good enough. Um, this shows um, um, U.S. non-corporate debt as a as a percentage of GDP. Um, notice in the depression, you can see the uh, the paradox of deleveraging really clearly. Uh, it's although this is an income measure, as with everybody trying to save more and spend less. The result was, well, GDP plunged, and so actually the ratio of debt to GDP actually shot up. Um, came down some during the, uh, uh, during the Roosevelt recovery, bounced up a little bit after Roosevelt uh, went to contractionary fiscal policies way too soon. Um, came down some more. Um, by the end of that stretch, um, the U.S. recovery is being, uh, uh, I guess you could say export-led uh, with an unusual kind of exports. We're really talking about Lend-Lease at this point. Uh, we're talking about the U.S. Uh, um, uh, shipping arms to, to Britain, mostly. Um, and then entry into the war. Um, what happened during the war was no private borrowing, private debt uh, unchanged. Um, but meanwhile, huge increase in real GDP, but also quite, despite price controls, quite a lot of inflation. And so you come out of the war with U.S. households having a very low level of debt. And that's probably the reason why you were able to, why, why the war's expansionary effects lasted long after the military spending uh, had, had come way down. Uh, we, we had a pair of balance sheets behind the cover of, um, of of, uh, of, of, um, of of wartime spending supporting the economy. Um, can we do something like that? Um, can can we rely on fiscal policy to support the the world's economies while the private sector rebuilds its balance sheets? Well, we're certainly not aiming in that direction at the moment. 
all uh, to the extent that we do have expansionary fiscal policies, they're relatively modest compared with the scale of the problem. That doesn't mean that they're trivial. Uh, the uh, the, com the Obama stimulus plan will significantly mitigate uh, unemployment. Uh, the, uh, the, the willingness of governments to let automatic stabilizers work, to let revenue fall without cutting spending, has certainly limited the extent of the slump. But it's not anything like really trying to uh, push up the economies and give the private sector a chance to, to do more. Uh, and we're being told that you can't, in fact, that we can't even continue current levels of deficits because of fear over government indebtedness. Um, and the numbers are impressive in one way, and yet there's something a little bit funny about the way we're, we're talking about all of this. Um, this is the United States. Uh, federal debt as a share of GDP. Um, of course, uh, spiked during the war. Um, long, uh, long fall, uh, something changed in uh, 1981 and we began to show, inc well, okay, uh, it's, uh, um, and, um, uh, and this is, the, this runs out to 2019. These are CBO, Congressional Budget Office projections uh, of, of uh, taking the Obama budget proposal into account. And it would bring U.S. debt up to levels that are um, still considerably below what they were at the end of World War II, but, but pretty impressive. Um, no one seems to have worried. There doesn't seem to have been a lot of talk uh, in 1946, 1947 about the U.S. losing its uh, AAA rating. Uh, and in fact, you know, we never did have any problem dealing with this. Uh, there have been a number of cases when, um, when advanced countries have temporarily had debt levels over 100% of GDP. Um, none of them have defaulted. Um, and in a way, you can say that that sort of makes sense not to get so worried. Here's a um, um, chart I used yesterday, just coming back to it. The uh, uh, you know, real interest rate on long-term government debt is, is under 2%. Uh, um, that's, so suppose you add debt equal to 50% of GDP, then the real cost of servicing that debt is 1% of GDP. That's not a big number for a modern government uh, uh, to be able to find that much revenue or find that much in budget cuts. Why should it really make a difference? Um, why should you get really all worked out of shape over debt increases on this level? Um, now, in reality, we are getting all worked up about it. Um, rating agencies, well, you know, one of the three rating agencies has said Britain is, is on its watch list, although uh, the others don't agree. Um, tremendous amount of concern. You can, um, I think it's, it's, it's really kind of over the top. Um, realistically, um, it, it's been pointed out, actually, John Quiggan, Australian economist, has pointed out that the rating agencies consistently are much, much tougher on government borrowers than they are on private sector borrowers. Uh, as we've seen recently, they'll get, they'll, on the private sector, they'll give AAA ratings to the damnedest stuff. Um, and on the other hand, governments are quite quickly put on watch list, even though certainly first world governments uh, almost never default. Uh, you have to go down to local government. You have to go down to Orange County to find examples. Um, but uh, it's, to some extent, of course, that it is the world we need to, to live in. But it is, there does seem to be an exaggerated amount of alarm over what, what's happening here. Now, the argument you could make, I'll make it about my country, is that actually in political terms we are no longer a first world country that we actually have this kind of partisan divide and inability to do what's needed uh, that, that makes our finances more like those of, of a Latin American nation than those of an advanced country. Uh, I guess I, I, maybe you've got to put some probability on that weight, but uh, some weight on, on that possibility, but I, I don't think it's really there. Um, and it is striking, um, going back to the Japanese story. Um, so the left scale, uh, is gross debt as a percentage of Japanese GDP. Um, Japanese net debt is a lot smaller, but uh, there are some problems with that. There are some funny assets included. So let me just use the gross debt number, it, admitting that it may be somewhat exaggerated. As a, but anyway, Japan clearly went a long way into debt 
uh, with its deficit spending during the last decade. Um, the red line is the long-term interest rate on Japanese government bonds, uh, right scale. Hard to see any, any, uh, anyone showing any concern about the solvency of the Japanese government despite this huge increase in debt, which you know, uh, would have led you to believe that, uh, that, that you, can, you can do this in an advanced country. Now, we are having all of these alarms. Um, the uh, lots of, uh, uh, I might say trash talking of, of uh, particularly well, um, Ireland, the UK, um, which are not fully bought by the market after you read a bunch of stories about Britain's uh, f dire fiscal position to actually look and discover that the interest rate on long-term British debt is only two-tenths of a percentage point above the interest rate on, on German long-term debt is kind of shocking. But, uh, but still, uh, concerns. I think we actually have a lot more room for fiscal uh, support than, than, is, is, than the conventional wisdom now says. But I have to say it's not the happiest story about how we're going to get through this, that we're going to have to have 10 years of big deficits while we, uh, while we wait for the private sector to repair its balance sheets. Um, what else can save us? Um, and I think there is two answers, well, three answers. Amongst the answers, um, the, uh, sorry, Monty Python buffs. Uh, uh, one first answer is, um, damned if I know. Um, the second answer is, the thing that would really solve the problem would be a, a surge in private investment, if, if uh, particularly business investment. If business investment would, would come along with a big boom, that would resolve a lot of the problems. Now, where is that going to come from? Uh, well, it would be helpful if somebody would invent a wonderful new technology demanding a lot of investment. Uh, if someone could invent the, the 21st century moral equivalent of the railroad, or, or actually even the moral equivalent of IT in the 90s, that would, would help a lot. Um, Maybe a little bit, uh, I, I worry that I may be being a little too hippy-dippy idealistic here, but I actually think that the prospect that we're really moving towards uh, finally doing something about climate change may have a side benefit, which is that the prospect of uh, increasingly high prices on carbon, but starting uh, low, uh, could lead to a lot of business investment in advance, both you know, obvious green technology stuff like, like wind power, uh, but also um, more mundane things like, like weatherproofing. Um, so possibly that could help us come along. Uh, the third uh, thing is it, it would be helpful if we could get some inflation. Um, not so much to inflate away the debt burden, but uh, so as to bring down real interest rates. Now in the case of Japan in the 90s, I was arguing that that was their only option. Um, uh, it turns out that the, for a while at least the current account did, did the tr job, but uh, the trouble with it, uh, the reason I'm not pushing the inflation option right now is that it ultimately depends not on what you do now, but on what you can commit yourself to doing later. Right now, conventional monetary policy anyway has no traction whatsoever. So what you really need is a commitment by the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England that it will, when the economy finally recovers, it will do what is necessary to deliver the inflation that was promised in 2009. And we're nowhere near having the kind of intellectual consensus that would make that possible now. Uh, you, uh, uh, good people, you know, talk, talk, uh, talk to Paul Volcker about the Fed adopting even this quite modest 2% inflation target, and he gets very upset. You know, he, he worked so hard to get us price stability. He doesn't like us to accept the idea of inflation. And there's a lot of this, so we're not, that we're not ready for that. Um, prediction, how will this end? Um, back to point one, I actually have no idea. Uh, it's, it, I'm really quite scared that, that we could muddle along. I think probably the, oh my God, the world is ending phase of this crisis is coming to an end. Uh, but I really do see the possibility of something that looks like a global version uh, of the Japanese lost decade without the possibility of the export-led recovery. So this could go on, this could be unpleasant for a very long time. And with that happy note, let's have some questions.
what, what a wonderful talk and, and what profound points. Uh, who wants to start? Given what you've said, oh, given what you've said about the uh, shadow um, banking system and its uh, role in the decline of the economy, yeah. what would be your advice to regulators in the UK? Um, well, it has to be regulated everywhere. I mean, this is now, we do have globalized finance, you know, uh, we've discovered that, that, uh, that, that um, people um, walking away from their condos in Florida can destroy uh, the economy of Iceland. So, um, uh, so it has to be a global and regulation. I think the form uh, or the, um, there's two things, one, one which, uh, which we can do, and I think, I think will be done, which is, uh, is basically capital requirements, but extended to, to anything that is functionally a bank, whether or not it's, it's called, it looks like a traditional bank. So basically, uh, um, restrictions on leverage, capital requirements extended very broadly. Uh, um, someone influential uh, repeating said, so you basically capital, capital, and, and still more capital. I think that's, that's what we can do. Now, there is, <laughs> that still might not re preserve the full stability that we used to have. One of the things that we had in the past was that there was not a whole lot of competition in banking. And, uh, and there was a franchise value uh, to banks, which made them unwilling to take excessive risks. Uh, but we can probably do a lot. And, and the, you know, we do want to say that um, uh, you know, a, a casual glance at the um, the world would say that basically speaking English gets you into big financial problems. Uh, but look at Canada, which you know mostly speaks something fairly close to English, eh? Um, and uh, and they never adopted. You know their political history is just very different from the shared history of the United States and the UK. Did not have the Reagan Thatcher Revolution. Did not uh, and retained pretty strong uh, oversight of the banks. And their banks are doing fine. So uh, that's what I would say, but it's got to be much bigger than just the convention, commercial, you know, not, not just depository institutions, but banking much more broadly. Uh, I think we'll probably in a few months be seeing some actual proposals on that coming out. It seems fairly clear that it's, or the consensus is that this crisis started in the U.S. with the security Securitization. Okay, sorry. The, the problem with this mic is, is that I can't actually get directional, so I, okay, thanks. So it starts with securitization, yeah. Securitization, the bubble in the U.S. that quickly spread to Britain, um, which was acting in some extent, to some extent equally badly, whereas you have countries like France and Germany that didn't do to anything like this extent uh, the same kind of stupid, in retrospect, activities. However, it is now predicted that the recovery will start in the U.S., will spread more quickly to Britain than to France and Germany. And my question is, what message does this send to people who act prudently the next time a crisis starts to rear its ugly head? Yeah. Well, you know, prudence in advance is a good thing, but uh, an active response is also a good thing. So, you know, part of the answer might be, uh, um, uh, um, have, have um, switched to Anglo-Saxon central bankers in a crisis, right? Uh, uh, there is, no, I mean, there is, there is you know, first of all, there's, there is a dramatic difference in activism between the Fed and the, the Bank of England on one side and, and the ECB on the other, uh, which is partly institutional. Uh, the Fed, I know best, the Fed has, in effect, a, has been backstopped fiscally by the, by the Treasury uh, so that the Fed can do all of these unconventional things and uh, although they say there's no chance that they'll actually lose on their investments, there obviously there is, and but but the Treasury will make it up. So the Fed can be very daring in its policy, and then you know two years from now it sends over an invoice to the Treasury that says thank you, and that will that will be 337 billion dollars for our trouble. Um, but it's also uh, so that's part of it. The the, uh, uh, the the policy has been much more active here and in the U.S., and I think that's that's that is a positive, and I. Uh, um, the other thing to say is that uh, life isn't fair. Uh, the, um, the, the worst hit economies have not been the economies that had the biggest bubbles, but the economies that were most concentrated in producing durable manufactured goods. Um, so J Japan and Germany 
get sideswiped terribly badly, even though they were not part of the financial excesses. And within the United States, uh, the industrial Midwest gets sideswiped extremely badly, even again, though the, though the bubbles were, were on the coasts. So um, it's, uh, things are a little complicated. And what it says about responsibility, first of all, the Europeans, continental Europeans were not all that responsible, although they didn't do the exotic stupid things that the, uh, that the Americans did. They did some more conventional stupid things, especially a lot of lending to, to Eastern Europe that, that really didn't make sense. Um, um, but beyond that, yeah, it's, in some ways it may be better to have, a, uh, to have policymakers who, uh, who respond aggressively when things go wrong, even if you've had lax policy in running up to the crisis. Yes, you've talked a lot about debt and interest rates and so forth, but very little about uh, um, jobs and unemployment. And I would, would suggest that um, uh, both the service industries and the um, manufacturing industries uh, look very gloomy at the moment oh, yeah. in terms of, of, of the future. And countries that uh, have been sensible, as you point out, like Canada, still has an enormous unemployment problem. And so I, I, I wonder really, how are we going to get out of that mess? Well, yeah, I mean, that, now, unemployment, by the way, I think that, that is, uh, maybe I wasn't clear enough, that is the point, that we, the, even if the financial markets are stabilizing, you know, and the stock market has been rallying, um, the employment situation is continuing to look bad and, and will probably continue to get worse. I mean, we, um, if, we if you had told people that the United States would have 9.4 percent unemployment uh, by by May of of, uh, of, of this year. Uh, if you told people that two years ago, you would have been dismissed as you know, crazily pessimistic, and that uh, and, and yet here we are. Um, and now, there, to some extent, uh, the Canadians actually are. They've had only about half, in percentage terms, about half as much employment decline as the United States. So they're they actually are somewhat insulated. But yeah, it's 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 bad everywhere, and there there are no safe havens. Uh, in in the case of Japan, uh, it's uh, I think widely agreed that premature policy tightening prolonged the agony. Yeah. Uh, now, to what extent do you think our policymakers have learned that lesson? And to what extent do you think the markets will let them not engage in premature policy tightening? The reason I mention markets in part is, although your chart suggests that all is well with the U.S. bond market, right. uh, if you look, say, at the one-year rate uh, nine years forward, that's now already above 6%. And that's how inflation scares start. I mean, you, you start there and you sort of come down. You know, if you get a few more months where the world doesn't look like it's coming to an end, it'll start spreading along the curve. Yeah. Um, yeah, markets are actually pricing in now a substantial possibility of a Fed funds rate increase later this year, which I think is, is bonkers, but, um, but the markets think it might happen. Um, uh, policymakers, current policymakers in the U.S. are extremely aware of the risks of premature tightening. They're, uh, they're, um, uh, it's almost a catechism. Uh, the, the, uh, um, the New Deal was great, except that Roosevelt didn't do enough, and he pulled back too soon. Uh, the, the Japanese, uh, so 1937 and 1997 loom very large in people's perception. 1937 being the year Roosevelt uh, stepped on the brakes and uh, not only put the economy back into a serious recession, but also squandered a lot of the political capital he had in the in, in the in the 38 elections, um, and 1997 being the year the Japanese decided, okay, things are looking better. Let's put on a let's let's have a big rise in taxation. Um, so they're very aware now, and and my impression is that policymakers here are also very aware of it. Um, there are two reasons for concern. Um, one is that's current management in both countries. Uh, the uh, um, the the United States, the uh, Republican leadership in the last couple of days has been saying, oh, well, you see, the economy is, is recovering, which is a funny thing to say because, you know, we only lost 345,000 jobs last month, but it's, uh, that's, th things getting worse more slowly has become recovery. And they're saying, so cancel the rest of the Obama stimulus. 
Um, and um, uh, particularly, and this, of course, the stimulus itself runs out. So if it, uh, will we be able to have the votes, the consensus to, to do more if it's necessary? Uh, and here, of course, uh, the, the, the conservatives, uh, although, um, okay, I, I'm allowed, right, to, to make, uh, in, in, so, so compared, compared with our opposition party, listen, reading, reading uh, David Cameron, it's kind of start startling because he almost sounds sane, but um, the, um, <laughs> the, uh, but they certainly are against any discretionary stimulus and are talking a lot about the need to start belt tightening right away. So they're, they're ready to do all of this. Um, um, and the markets, um, there is the possibility of a kind of self-fulfilling pessimism. If the markets become, come to believe that, that countries will, might well default, then, then um, interest rates uh, on government debt can rise and that actually force the governments into, uh, into contractionary policies. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't swear that that won't happen. I, uh, it's one of the things I think almost a role that, that economists need to play is to partly, you know, second guess the markets and say, you know, look, these debt numbers historically in terms of the actual debt service are really not that bad, but, but uh, there is a concern. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually quite worried that one way or another we will let up before the job is done. Now again, it's, it's a great source of reassurance that, the, that management in Washington right now understands all this perfectly well and, and uh, they'll start saying it almost before, before you do, but, but whether they will continue to be the management uh, and whether they'll be, have the freedom uh, whether the bond market vigilantes will force them into doing something different is a concern. You have been uh, repeatedly coming back uh, to the problem of uh, the lower bound of interest rate, yeah. but you didn't think it was possible to credibly commit now to a higher inflation in the future in order to be able to lower real interest rates further now. Uh, should it be contemplated to raise the inflation target for all future, given the severe problem that is caused by the nominal lower bound? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, um, this crisis has made a pretty good case that 2%, which was the formal or informal target of a lot of central banks, is too low. Um, there is, I haven't hunted it up, I remember there was a Fed paper uh, from a few years ago arguing that a 2% inflation rate would make the chance of actually hitting the zero lower bound vanishingly small and well we saw what happened to that so uh, the that there really would be a case for a three to four percent inflation target um, good luck on trying to sell that although we have a lot of you know relatively open-minded policymakers it went 50 years after the Great Depression without a major financial crisis there were bubbles but they weren't that big and the bursting didn't do that much damage um, so, you know, it's actually, uh, as uh, I was just, uh, this was just pointed out to me, the, uh, in real terms, the stock market decline from uh, 1973 to 1975 was worse than the stock market decline at the beginning of the Great Depression. But obviously, it did not produce a, a, a sustained economic crisis at all. Um, so a better regulated financial system, more regulated financial system would be a good thing. Um, then there's a question about active policy to burst bubbles. Um, and um, the, um, I'd say the, certainly the case has been made. You know, what we used to call the Greenspan Doctrine, which was don't worry about bubbles, you can always clean up the mess afterwards, has, has now been pretty decisively refuted. Um, there's still, I still wouldn't rely on it too much. I mean, the fact of the matter is that we did not have anything like uniform agreement that there was a housing bubble. Uh, on the contrary, most, most Fed pronouncements said that there was not, even though it was the clearest thing I've ever seen uh, in my life uh, economically, and yet people failed to see the, failed to see the, the, the greatest housing bubble in, in history. So um, but I think there is now a good case for getting policymakers to act to burst bubbles, but I think it's, you have to bear in mind it is going to be hard. They, they're not going to get it right all the time. Given what you said about uh, individual stimulus um, by different countries being relatively modest compared with the size of the problem, yeah. 
Um, what would your comments be on the size of the Chinese stimulus, particularly in terms of, uh, you know, how much bigger could it be? And also in terms of the possibility, I, I, I understand it's remote, not least because of the Chinese propensity to save in the face of lack of basic health services, but of a dramatic increase in Chinese domestic consumption. I mean, how much effect could that have and how quickly? Oh, boy. Um, first of all, background. The Chinese economy, you know, it's, it's now on a purchasing power basis, uh, supposedly about half the size of the U.S. economy, but on a market exchange rate basis, uh, much less than that. It's still a smaller economy than Japan in terms of, of actual cash. Um, so China can't make that much difference to the world. Um, about their stimulus, um, what do we believe? Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, all economic statistics are a peculiarly boring form of science fiction, uh, but the Chinese probably more than most. Um, and there have been some contrary indicators, power consumption. Uh, somehow has been falling instead of rising. So are they actually doing it? You know, and I do worry a little bit. I, I mean, I don't know this, right? So I'm just being, but, but I, I've gotten all sorts of opinions from people who, who, uh, who, who, who do study China. And it, it's unclear uh, how much is really happening. I mean, certainly something is happening, but you do have the sense if you've got an authoritarian regime that tells local governments, because basically this is implemented at the local level, that tells local governments you will do massive infrastructure spending immediately, uh, that the local governments will in fact report back to Beijing. We have done lots of infrastructure spending immediately, and, and that will show up in the official statistics, but is it what's actually happening on the ground? And that's unclear. So I, I don't know the answer to that. There is. Uh, um, uh, they certainly have, have you know, tried to move pretty fast, but it's, it's really uh, unclear what's actually happening. I think I'm afraid we're end. going to have to stop. Um, but uh, what a tremendous lecture. Uh, the, the points, can you hear this? The points, the points that Paul has been making are, are so important that I just hope that they're getting across to uh, all our politicians uh, here as well as elsewhere. When I was educated uh, in macroeconomics, it was a rather long time ago, the explanation that was given for why there wasn't a slump after the Second World War was not what the government did, but what people thought the government would do if it was necessary. And it seems to me that's incredibly important in our current situation. Does the public believe that the government will do what it takes if it's necessary, or, or doesn't it? And that. Uh, uh, will depend on whether they uh, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest what Paul has told us. So, thank you so much, Paul, and I hope we'll Thanks see you all tomorrow.